Doubt is a natural part of the spiritual journey, of the search. The great words when Jesus says, Seek and you will find. Ask, knock. He is inviting us to question and wonder and discover for ourselves not to take somebody's word for it, not to assume that it comes ready-made in a package, but to discover in our own individual way what it means to understand these teachings, to apply them to our lives, to encounter the reality of spirit, the reality of the sacred, the reality of what Christians call the risen Christ, the presence of God. All of these are more than ideas, more than beliefs, they are experiences that people just like you and me have gone through, down through the centuries, lives radically changed, lifted out of all sorts of desperate conditions because of that inner awakening, that opening of the door of the heart. From the famous words in Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever will open and let me in, I will dine with them. I will interact with them, participate in their lives, commune with them. This is the gift of what religion is meant to do for us. Religion meaning not an institution, not a set of doctrines, but the word meaning relink, reconnect us to the reality at the heart of our existence, the reality of that which we call God. The one revealed through the Hebrew teachings as I am the one who is. The very essence of revealed all the more through Christ as the one who loves unconditionally. The one who brings forth sun and rain on the just and the unjust. The one who seeks us and through the presence of Christ in history sacrifices out of love for each of us, seeking to bring us into that relationship, a relationship that is known and felt, melts us down, brings out the best of who we are, heals our wounds. And so today we look at that famous passage in Scripture after the resurrection, when one of the disciples, Thomas, doubts whether it has happened or not. Can you imagine that moment when the disciples, right after the crucifixion, are huddled together in absolute terror and total despair? They have seen the Savior, the Master, this Holy One horrifically tortured and killed, all is lost, all hope of the beauty that is made possible in our life through the reality of God is taken away by the cruelty and darkness of humanity. And there they are, not knowing what to do, knowing their lives are in danger. And in that moment of the worst kind of hopelessness, perhaps something that you have personally known. We are told that the risen Christ appears before them. The words are, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the people around them, Jesus came and stood among them. You'll notice the doors are locked. 
presence of Christ appears among them anyway. And that in itself is a teaching. Even when you and I have locked the doors of our heart to the deeper truth of life, to the real calling on our lives, even then sometimes when we don't want anything to do with spirit, with the sacred, with the divine, with the one called Jesus, sometimes he enters into our heart of hearts anyway, even when we have hidden ourselves behind locked doors. And what does he say? Peace be with you. Now understand that in that time, a word like that was not like, hello, good evening, I hope you're doing well. It was a word of power that brought with it the peace that changes lives. He invoked peace among them. And in that instant, even beyond the supernatural reality that they were facing, he brought them a healing peace, the very same peace that can be brought to you as you allow yourself to receive this spiritual presence which is seeking you always, even behind your locked doors. And we find that all those promises that Jesus had spoken that we find in the chapters of the Gospel of John 14, 15, 16 known to scholars as the farewell discourses when Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. The world cannot give us that kind of permanent peace, that kind of transcendent peace. These are promises that we must have the courage to open ourselves to even in the hardest times, even against all odds. You will not be left orphaned. Whatever your situation, whatever the tragedy, the Holy One says, I will not leave you orphaned. And so we too, like the terrified disciples, are called upon to receive this these promises, these revelations of the nature of spirit. And so we find that after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. He wanted them to see the authenticity of his humanity, even in this resurrected form. And this is significant because one of the many conflicts in the church the early church and today, but particularly then with Greek philosophy and such, was the idea that Christ must have been uh, a spirit unlike us and that he didn't really uh, die on the cross uh, in a human way, uh, that it couldn't possibly be that he was fully human and fully divine. And this is what the wisdom of the early church finally rallied around in understanding truly human truly divine why is that important to you and me because it tells us that jesus entered our human condition that spirit entered incarnated into our flesh into our pain into our mortality meaning that there is no place in which god is not there is no humanity that is left outside of the presence of God. Jesus went all the way into what it means to be human, what it means to be you and me. So that in our worst sense of abandonment from all things and from God, we are not abandoned. That is part of the message of the cross. He went to the farthest reaches of our human suffering to fill it 
with not only the presence but the victory of God. You know that crucifix is not just a Roman instrument of horrific torture. In the early church, the cross had no body on it. In the catacombs in Rome, you would find, you still find, these images of the cross, or even in the Orthodox churches of the East, a cross with no body, because the cross does not represent death and torture. It represented most of our victory, God's victory over the darkness, the cruelty, the evil of this world the ignorance of humanity. It also means deeper metaphysical wisdom. That cross going this way, the vertical line, is our life through time. And the horizontal line of the cross is eternity breaking into time. And in that cross point of the cross, which is the present moment, those who open themselves to the reality of spirit, who become transparent to the divine, if you will, as some have said, can in the moment experience, receive, share something of the quality of eternity. Christians were called in the early days witnesses to eternity. As passengers through time, we witness to that which is timeless. Our true home, our true power. So all of this comprises the meaning of this cross, of the crucifixion, and then of course the resurrection, the triumph over death, and all that seeks to take away the beauty of being a child of God, of, of being alive. And so he needs to show them that he did suffer, that he isn't just a ghost or a supernatural being, that in fact those wounds are real. Some theologians have suggested that sometimes some of us who suffer long-term wounds who are not healed and saved from that suffering, sometimes that can become a witness to others of the power of spirit as we nobly overcome. Perhaps you know someone who has great physical suffering or limitations and yet is full of joy, full of peace, full of love, full of selflessness. What a witness that is to those around them. Then we find again Jesus says, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And so he calls upon all who are sensitive to this reality to be sent. The word apostle means to be sent, apostello sent into the world, into the world around you, not distant lands as missionaries, but just to everybody around you, sent to be a presence, a witness of the goodness and presence of God. You have that calling. It all depends on how much you want to open your heart in trust and faith and experience spirit coming through you, helping you and reaching out to others. And we find that uh, among them, one of them is missing, Thomas. One of the twelve, one of the specially chosen, is not with the community in this hour of crisis, has decided to go off on his own, maybe out of fear, self-pity, whatever, he is not there to witness this extraordinary event. Imagine missing the appearance of the resurrected Lord. And in that appearance to 
that gathered community of the faithful. Jesus is said to breathe on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Spirit, in ancient Hebrew meaning breath of God. You know, when we breathe in and out, when we inspire breath, that's tied into inspiration, receiving spirit. Each breath we take, we receive energy from God. The opportunity, if we are conscious enough, to use it for God's purposes, to recognize in that moment of breathing we have the reality of the sacred and the glory of what life is. So Jesus breathes on them the power of spirit opens them to that new understanding, new way of being that transformed the world out of these 12 desperate people. You know, that's one of the facts that are held up to folks who just can't grasp the possibility of Christ's resurrection. The simple fact that those 12 terrified people, men and women, suddenly, out of nowhere, went from despair and hopelessness and terror to overwhelming exuberance and empowerment and courage and went out across the world and started this world religion. That's not to say that deviations and mistakes didn't come along the way. We all know that. We all know about wars in the name of the God of peace. But the original essence of it, spirit-driven, Holy Spirit-driven, arose out of that darkness and despair, proving the power of God's presence through the resurrection of Christ spite of the darkness and cruelty around him. And so we find that Thomas is not there, and so he joins the disciples and says, and is told by the disciples, we have seen the Lord. Imagine the look in their eyes, the light in their faces. We have seen the Lord. And Thomas, just like you and me, says, oh, really? I need to see it to believe it. You know, like the Missouri state, the show me state, the cynicism of humanity. All of his friends are transformed by this exuberant experience, but it's not good enough for him. And so, what happens? The man rejects this event, having known Christ personally, and instead of being struck by lightning, Jesus appears to him a week later. Thomas has said to the disciples, I won't believe until I actually touch the wounds. That's how cynical he is, so representative of how we are in the 21st century. So materialistic, so three-dimensional. You only believe what you can see and hear, shut off from the mystery and wonder of life. But Jesus humbly returns to allow him as he allows you in your time of doubt, to discover, to see for yourself. And Thomas, in fact, touches the wounds of this transfigured body. And he says then, in that moment, my Lord and my God, this man of doubt and cynicism, says the most extraordinary confession in the entire New Testament, my Lord and my God recognizing the meaning of Christ's presence in the world, the presence of God incarnated in humanity, God among us. And he went on to be one of the great apostles beginning churches in India that are still standing to this day, martyred as were most of the disciples, but victorious over himself in the hardships of this world because empowered by the knowledge of the presence of 
the risen Lord of the Holy Spirit in their lives. This was the result of his doubt, and it can be the result of your doubt. When one day you say, my Lord and my God, knowing that that nearness and companionship is yours as well, may you discover that truth today. God bless you.